A lot of developers have a fundamental misunderstanding of what Next.js is and end up using it as the default way for building React apps. Now, technically, this isn't wrong, but the logic behind it is, and this leads to over-engineered apps and shipping a lot of extra bloat that we don't need. Now, let's make one thing clear. Next.js is not React. It's React with a bunch of cool things wrapped around it, which makes it insanely useful, but we need to understand why we're using these things because if we just ship it just because it's there, now we're simply overloading our app and we're actually making it worse. Now, the biggest contributor that I've seen to this problem is how people are learning React. A lot of people are watching online tutorials, reading written articles, and when they're being taught React, they're being taught in the context of Next JS. And what ends up happening is they don't know where React ends and where Next.js begins, so they kind of see it as the same thing without actually understanding all the extra benefits. So first, let's go ahead and actually take a look at the core differences. This is gonna be a high-level overview, but I think we need to get this part figured out before we dive deeper. So starting with React, this is a library for building dynamic interfaces. Now, a lot of the code that you're writing within Next.js when it comes to those UI components, that is React. Now, React is very minimalist, it's lightweight, and it it doesn't really care about what you do with your application. There are really no set rules. So when it comes to page routing, data fetching, React leaves it up to you to choose external libraries to integrate into your application. So you might use React Router DOM or TanStack Router to work with your application for routing. There's Redux, Context API, TanStack Query for state management, and so on. Now, this is great because you have a lot of flexibility, but it also means that you need to understand what to use and when you want to use it. Now, the beauty of all this is that you pick and choose and you're not bloating your application with a bunch of extra stuff. Now, Next.js, on the other hand, is a full stack framework built on top of React. So think of it like React, but all beefed up with a bunch of extra features. And if we have these features, we might as well use them and understand when and why we're using them. So Next.js comes with full server capabilities. You're able to create API routes, create server components, and a bunch of other stuff. But what I'm seeing developers do is they'll spin up a Next.js application, then they'll make all their components be client components, so they're basically creating a single page application. And then if they have a server, they'll spin up some kind of Express server, Go, Python server, and they'll create an API there and call those endpoints. Now, this isn't necessarily wrong, but they're not taking advantage of any of these Next.js features. So what I wanna do is go ahead and actually look at some of these and try to understand why and when we're using it. So I went to ChatGPT, I wanted to see what kind of summary I get here, and ChatGPT actually gave me a decent overview here. So first of all, we have a feature breakdown. So routing, server-side rendering, static site generation, server components, API routes, middleware, data fetching primitives, image optimization, SEO, these are all things that Next.js has and React doesn't. Now, when you might wanna go with React or Next.js, we have a decent breakdown here too. So first of all, one of the biggest ones, SEO. If SEO matters to you, if you want search engines to find your website and actually read the content on it, Next.js, this is a big one, probably one of the biggest features here that you might wanna use out of it. We have static site generation. If you're writing blogs and you wanna just render these files on their own, that's useful. If you wanna create your backend within your React application, you don't wanna spin up your own server. This is also very nice for authentication. This is good. And of course, a production ready framework. Now, looking at React, there are cases where just using React does make sense. So if you wanna spin up a simple a single page application, you wanna use a different router for some page routing, that's gonna be nice, but if SEO and SSR does not matter to you, then in many cases, you might want to stick with just React. So some kind of internal dashboard that you don't really want to optimize for users or search engines. In many cases, you might be fine with a React application. So what I wanna do from here is I wanna actually look at a sample application here. So I spun up an application and we wanna look through it and see how we can modify this application to actually benefit from some of Next.js features because this application right here is using Next.js but it doesn't leverage any of its core features. Now I have this website that I wanna use as an example of what people are doing wrong and how we can actually optimize this. So we have an e-commerce website and I essentially built a Next.js application but I'm not leveraging things like server 
server side rendering. So this is what I'm seeing people do. Now, this page right here is rendered on the client. It's a client component. If I go to a product detail page, this is also a client component. Now, the issue here is that when you're building something like an e-commerce website, which is a great use case for Next.js, we want search engines to find this. But if we're rendering content on the client side, what's happening is we're shipping a bunch of JavaScript code and then JavaScript is rendering out all the content itself. And search engines have a hard time finding that. They've gotten a little bit better at this, but for the most part, we want this pre-rendered so search engines can actually see what's on the page. And in this case, we're making that difficult. Now, the other thing is page speed. When we're building an e-commerce website, faster perceived page speed matters. When users load up a page and things are being added to the DOM, this takes a little bit and users can leave websites. There's a lot of data that points to e-commerce websites needing good page speed. So with server-side rendering, we can preload what we need and then any extra parts we can add on later on the client side. So that's very beneficial. Of course, we get benefits of caching. We're able to make sure that our website's more reliable. So if someone has a bad browser, slow internet, we're able to put that load on our server and ensure that someone doesn't have a problem with their website just because they have poor connection and their browser isn't working that well. Okay, so now I wanna jump into the code and I wanna show you what this application looks like. We'll review a few things and then we'll actually change this to use some server benefits here. So first of all, we have two main pages here. So we have our products page and if you look here, this right here is a client component. We're using the use client directive. Now from here, we have an app right back in here and we're using the client SDK. So essentially we're just accessing our database directly here and then we're setting up a bunch of state, right? We're setting our loading state, we're rendering products, Products. Of course, we use use effect. I didn't say this site was optimized. There's plenty of better ways to do this, but this is where we're calling the products here. So we're making a request and then we're loading the data up and we're going to modify all of this. Now products, same thing. We essentially load up a bunch of content. We pass in the ID, use use effect, make the request, and then paint the DOM from here. Now, because we're using AppRite, we have an AppRite client config. Now, whatever backend you're using, whether you're just calling some API endpoints or you're using some kind of SDK, you're gonna have some kind of config file where you set things up here. Now, with AppRite, AppRite gives us server and client SDKs. And what we're doing is creating a single instance of our client SDK, a single instance of our database, and then we're using that throughout our application because once we set this up, it's kind of like a single page application and we're able to use this throughout. So this right here is going to change in that core configuration. Now in the instance of AppRite, we're going to create a whole different config file in the same folder, but this is going to be called server.ts. Now the AppRite client SDK is called AppRite. The node SDK is called node AppRite. So we'll just go ahead and install that. Now with the server SDK, we'll also need the same imports, but they're coming from node AppRite instead of AppRite. Instead of just initializing our SDK, we're gonna initialize our client within the create admin client helper. Now, the reason for this is that when we're using this, we don't wanna share our state with any other parts of our application. So if we wanna use it, we wanna initialize this in a new instance, and then we wanna access these things. Now with a node AppRite SDK, we're gonna use the set key method here. And essentially through our AppRite console, we're gonna give this key permissions here and whatever permissions this key has now that's going to be our client instance and this is how we're able to set those controls now the next thing i want to do is go ahead and initialize my database my account if i'm using other services like storage we'll want to do that here and then we can simply just go ahead and return them and now we can access these from the create admin client method so last thing we want to do is just go ahead and export this so now we want to start with the home page here so first thing is we want to make this a server component so we want to remove that we want to remove our database from the client instance. We don't need use state and use effect anymore. Of course, we can remove these. And now everything from use effect to our get products method, we can remove here. I can also go ahead and get rid of this loading state here. And this should create a clean version of my application. Starting with a clean slate, we'll import the create admin client method, and then we want to go ahead and get our database instance. Now from here, we're going to render out our products here, and we're just going to call list rows for that. We'll pass in our environment variables, our database ID, our table ID, and now I want to run the server and console products out so you can see that this is actually running on the server and not the client. Oh, and we're using a server component, so I want to make sure that we make this an async function, and that way we're able to call everything successfully. So now if I refresh my page, we're going to see this right here in the terminal and no longer in the console. Now take a look at this. If we go into the website here, if we go into inspect, we'll go to the network tab. 
And if we look at this, when the page is loaded, this is what Google is gonna see now. So now we can actually see all our page contents and search engines can now crawl this page. So let's do the same for the product detail page because this is the important part. So from the product detail page, we'll go ahead and remove all the code we don't need here. We'll make sure that this is now a server component and not a client component. We can go ahead and get rid of all this code right here and we'll also clean up our page contents. So here, now that we have a clean page, we can do the same thing. We'll import create admin client. Let's make sure this is an async function. Now to get the params, there's different ways, but in this case, I'm gonna use await and just call it directly like this. And then we can get our database instance. We'll make the request to get our products. We'll pass in the row ID, and then all of this content right here should be the same because we're just getting a product instance. So now let's go ahead and check this out and let's make sure this is run on the server. So we'll go to the network tab again, and here we go. We see all of our product details right here. That's exactly what we wanted. So moving some requests to the server was actually pretty easy. All we had to do is use a different SDK. We modified how we actually use it, and then we just created some server components and made requests. But I wanna show you how to perform some authenticated requests, and specifically if you're using the AppRite SDK, because this is gonna change a little bit here. So we have this create admin client, and we wanna use this anytime we want permissions from the key, and if we want to perform some kind of request that's not in particularly related to a user but when a user logs in we want to use some kind of session id and we want to pass that into our client instance and this is what's going to change so we're going to build in some login functionality we'll set up that session and then we're going to create another client instance that's going to leverage this and this one's going to be called create session client but it's going to look very similar to this one so before we set up the full session client let's actually go ahead and create that login page so this will be in the public folder here, and we're just gonna create a new file and folder. And from here, we're just gonna go ahead and set up a new login form field. So we'll create the form, we'll add a little bit of styling to this, and then let's go ahead and set up the email input field here. Then we'll add in a password field, and then finally the login button. So if we check the page out, this is what it should look like. So that looks pretty good. Now to create the login functionality, we're gonna go ahead and use a server action to process everything. So first thing we'll wanna do here is go ahead and import create admin client, and then let's create a function called create session. And from here, we're gonna specify the use server directive right here to make sure that this is now a server action. Now from here, we'll go ahead and get the data from the form, then let's grab the email and password, and then we're gonna use the account class here from create admin, and we're able to actually create a session this way. So from here, we can go ahead and actually create the session and then set the session value. And the last thing we wanna do is go ahead and set some cookies. So let's import cookies from next headers here. Let's also import redirect. And then let's go ahead and set the session cookie right here by setting HTTP only to true. We'll set same site to restrict secure true and then we'll just go ahead and set that date so now all we have to do is go ahead and go to the form add action and then go ahead and call the create session method so what this is going to do is this will go ahead and create a session set that in our cookies and then it's going to redirect us to the home page now, just to make sure everything's working, I created a user inside of my app right backend. So I have some credentials here. We're just gonna go ahead and add in the username and password, and we'll just make sure we can actually see that session cookie being set. So I'll pass in my email and password, and let's go ahead and check this out and look at this. So here we see inside of our application cookies, we see this session is now set. So technically we're logged in. Now in the next section, what I wanna do is go ahead and add in some protected routes and we're gonna get some orders that are related to this specific user. And this is where we're gonna see that session client actually work from this session value right here. So this will be our protected route folder, but this folder also needs its own layout and that's where we're gonna create our authentication check. So we don't have a way to get our user yet. So inside of our protected layout for now, we're just gonna set user to null and we're gonna run a check right here and we're gonna simulate an authenticated user. So we'll import redirect because if we don't have a user, we wanna redirect them. And then we'll use the user value to redirect a user if they happen to not be authenticated yet. So let's go ahead and actually add in the order page now. So orders will go inside of this protected routes folder here and we'll just go ahead and set up the initial component. And for now, let's just output orders and we'll set up the details here in a second. Now back in our server config, we started creating this create session client method. Now we're gonna go ahead and do the same thing. We're gonna create a client, but in this case, we're not gonna set a key. Instead, what we're gonna do is we're gonna get the session cookie and we're gonna pass this into the client instance. So let's import cookies at the top here. And then we want to access our cookie store and then get that session value here because that's what we set inside of our cookies. And you can see that right here. So it's called session and that's how we're accessing it. 
So once we have that cookie, we can call this client.setSession method. So we're gonna check if we have a cookie, then we call this method, and this is how permissions are set to this client. So we have a client that can perform admin level requests. So all things that we need just to access our database, like rendering products and so on, setting up sessions or creating sessions, that's fine with the admin client. But when we're acting on the behalf of a user, we pass in that session cookie, and now this client instance knows who the user is. So it's a user has permissions to certain pages, maybe certain items in the database. If a user place orders and they only have permissions to those orders, now when we query those orders, we'll only see the orders that the user is allowed to see. And this is how we're able to manage that and why we want to separate these into a session client and an admin client. And you'll see that on display in a second here. Now from here, we can just go ahead and grab our database, our account instance. If we want to get the user's profile information, we want to return that. And then we're just going to go ahead and export these. So now we wanna use our session client throughout our application to actually access protected pages and access a user's data. Now, here's the thing. If I go to the orders page, this is in that protected files route. So if I go to this page, it redirects me back to the login page. And that's because of this layout that we set up here. So let's go ahead and actually update this. So the first thing we'll wanna do is get the create session client method. So we're using session client and not admin client. Now from here, I'm not gonna do my best to set everything up the right way. I'm just gonna make sure it works. We're just gonna go ahead and first get a user here. So first thing I'll need to do is go ahead and access the account instance, and that's coming from the create session client method. Now from here, we can just go ahead and actually get the user by calling account.get, and this will actually retrieve the current user. If we don't have a session, well, this won't work at all and we're just going to get redirected. Now, if we check for the user and the user's not there, we'll be sent to the login page. If we are, then we can continue. Now, typically you'd want to add in some try catch statement, but we're not focusing on all of that. So again, we have a session. So let's go ahead and try this out. This should in theory work. So now if I go into the orders page, let's go ahead and visit it and look at that. We're able to actually access this orders page. Now, if I go into application, if I go to this session and I delete it, then I refresh, this will redirect me back to the login page. So real quick, I'll just log in, make sure we have another session, and then we'll proceed from here and actually get our orders. Okay, so we have a session here, so we're set to go. So now in the orders page, we have the easy part. We've done this before, but in this case, we're importing session client instead of admin client. Then we'll just go ahead and access the database from session client. I'll make sure that this is an async function. And then all I need to do is just access my orders by making this request to the database here. And in this case, it should only return orders that I have access to as this user. And just to keep this simple, I'm just gonna go ahead and create a list here. We'll just map through some of the orders. We'll render out the total and status so we can see something. And let's look at the page. So here we go. We see two orders. We have one pending and one that's been refunded. Now we didn't perform any extra queries here in our orders database. We can see that we have more than two orders, but this user only has access to two of them. So we only get two orders. Now, if I change this to create admin client, Client here and use that, this would get me all the orders. So that's the difference between a session client and an admin client. All right. So that's it for this video. I hope you learned a lot. If you have any questions, make sure to leave me a question down in the comment section and be sure to subscribe to the channel, like the video, and I'll see you all in the next video.